The opinions expressed in this show are the views of the host and not necessarily that of WTRW, 94.3 The Talker, or the Bold Gold Media Group. Joining us also today is our guest, Mr. Nick, Nick Rose. Nick, how are you today? Very well, thank you. And you are the proprietor and owner of the Barryville Area Arts Center, which you were telling me uh, you're doing in your spare time now that you've retired. Yes, it's more like a hobby. It is a nonprofit 501c3. That includes other people besides me. But that uh, we were talking off air about my passion, and my passion is really um, advocating for the population that I served during my straight life, which was in substance abuse treatment. Right, right. I love that. So how does this subject, the passion that you shared with me, Nick, was very, very um, invigorating and motivating. But tell me, how does happiness pie into it? Um, we were talking well, about how did you get interested in the subject of happiness? How does happiness have anything to do with drug and alcohol treatment? It's my well, question. Well, happiness is the best protective factor that you could have. People always do research about protective factors. And, you know, a happy person who everything is going well in their life, they're not attracted to alcohol and drugs the way somebody who is miserable might be. There's nothing they're trying to escape. There's no pain they're trying to mitigate. So uh, I, yeah, our place was a residential substance abuse treatment center uh, right in Barryville here. And it was almost like a laboratory for happiness because the people were, I, would say, I won't say captive, but it was a residential center where you could really control the environment. So it was almost like a, a laboratory. And a lot of the people who came, didn't really even want to be there. They had a choice between prison or treatment, and they chose naturally treatment. So um, we had a long enough time to work with them that without, just by observing, you could see that when they came to be happier and cared more about themselves, uh, they, the draw of drugs wasn't as strong. So it wasn't a, uh, um, a kind of a punitive place, although they were mandated to be there, you're still driven to find out something about the person, something about their happiness, and it's a protective factor, you're saying. Did you come yeah. to realize this over a period of time, or, or was this part of the program? Uh, yes, we all came to realize it together at the program over a period of time, because the, the, that population is really the most um, maltreated, I think, of any population. It's still the only business that I can think of where anytime something goes wrong, you blame the customer. No matter what happens, you know, the person wasn't ready for treatment. Oh, they're just an alcoholic. There's all these different names. The whole language is invented just to call names of the people that have that problem. And in no other field would, would you get away with that. But like say you were a surgeon and you were operating on someone, uh, someone's heart and they died on the operating table. The surgeon would never say, that uncooperative SOB. Can you imagine? He died and he bled all over my table. I told him to stop <laughs> the table, but he wouldn't listen. You know, and that's laughable. But that's what happens to people who come to addiction treatment. They say, you know, they weren't ready for treatment. There's no other place where, like, if you break your arm, go to the emergency ward, they have to be ready for you. You don't have to be ready to get your arm fixed. You know, the fact that your arm is broken is reason to be, that means you're ready. So there's a lot of excuses that um, people who treat addicts and alcoholics use that I don't, still don't know how they get away with it. It's, it's come a long way since I've been in the field. I've been in the field for a long time and wrote a lot about it, but it's still uh, too common. It, it's true. There is a kind of a, a, a shame and guilt and a, a type of blame that's put on what's called addicts. We don't use the word addicts in the field anymore. We could say addicted to cocaine, but we don't say addicts anymore. We say a person with a substance abuse disorder uh, to try to get away from the stigma uh, and, I, and I think you're really hitting it solid, uh, Nick, right on the head when you talk about stigma and blame. And nobody would say, like, well, the guy had a, uh, I was operating on his kidney and he had a heart attack, the son of a gun. Uh, yeah. You know, no, no, you can't blame me. Look, at the guy's uncooperative. Guilt, guilt and shame is a lot of the reason that they were, be, became addicted in the first place. So doing them, there was an old school thing. Hopefully this isn't done anymore, but where, you know, they would break the person down who came to the place and then try to build them back up. But the people who we saw at New Hope Manor, where I worked, it was an all-female place, and they were already so broken down when they came, the idea of breaking them down more just didn't make any sense at all. Uh, they needed to understand that 
happiness was a possibility. Like they'd probably given up on happiness, and that's why they chose the second best thing, uh, pleasure. A lot of people confuse happiness and pleasure. So uh, when you have, you know, pleasure, you forget about things for a little while, but happiness is more permanent. You know, I believe that, Nick. I believe in what you're saying. Pleasure could be um, alcohol. It could be drugs. It could be um, pornography. It could be gambling. But that's just a pleasure chemical. It's just a pleasure experience. It's not happiness. Happiness could be more of a state of, of being, even. Yes. And it's not that you'll never be sad. I think sadness is a part of happiness. Um, right. Sadness just means you lost something that you had or something has changed that you like. But that's good news because you had something that, that was good before that you lost. Uh, you know, depression is different. Clinical depression is the opposite of happiness. But sadness, I think, is included in happiness. So there's a lot of mistakes people make when they're thinking about happiness. Uh, some people think the same thing with the people that came to us. Suffering uh, is a great motivator for change. And we found that not to be true. Um, if suffering was a great motivator for change, I told the women who came to us, they would all be Mother Teresa by now because they all suffered so much before, <laughs> before they even came to us. So there's still this, um, I don't know where it came from, but this idea that uh, when, I, when I speak, I ask, you know, give me an example of how, you know, suffering helped you. And well, a lot of hands go up and people give me a lot of examples. But in all those examples, there's another person who had that exact same experience and didn't work out so good for them. If you were... Um, if you came through a really hard time and you say attribute your success to the suffering, you're selling yourself short because another person went through that hard time and did bad things. Like if you were abused as a child and you came through it and now you're a happy person, that's really good. That means you're a special person. It doesn't mean that you needed to go through that suffering to be a good person because there's another person we know who was abused as a child and when they grow up, they become a child abuser and that happens lots of times. So people often attribute misattribute to suffering uh, something good when I, I think you can learn more from joy and delight than you can from suffering. What is, what is the biggest obstacle to, to happiness, Nick, in your opinion? Well, I usually ask who's willing to be happy when I speak someplace and everybody's hand gets raised. Uh, and I say, who's really willing to be huh. happy? You know, all the hands go up again. And then I say, well, what's keeping you? And then they give me these uh, things about, you know, maybe they have financial troubles, maybe they have relationship issues, uh, maybe they have grief issues. And so then they say, well, you're, you're not really saying you want to be happy, period. You're saying you want to be happy, but only if uh, you win the lottery. You want to be happy, but, you know, your goldfish just died and you're, you're sad about it. So, so you want to, be, want to be happy if goldfish never die, if you win the lottery. <laughs> like you put so many conditions on it. So we try to change that to I want to be happy, period. So you're happy no matter what happens. The, the, the main obstacle, I think, is attributing to external uh, forces and letting that decide right. whether you're right. happy or not instead of deciding yourself to be happy. It's almost like uh, one of the uh, principles of AA considers itself uh, uh, understood in the terms of acceptance. And acceptance is a big part of uh, recovery, I understand. And yes. if you're going to be happy, well, I didn't hit the lottery. Well, I'm not happy. Well, right. I didn't get the car I wanted. I'm not happy. So you're only willing but to be happy. You have a Rolls Royce, and you win the lottery every third day. So, so that's not a realistic expectation. Right, right. So you're always going to be unhappy if you do it that way. And you mentioned AA. Like, AA is helpful to some people, but there's a million different ways that can be helpful to a person. I think that's another problem in the field of addiction. You, you have to invent a new way of recovery for each person who needs you. So an, anybody who says, one of the reasons I think recovering people aren't always effective as counselors is because they believe the only way to help anybody is the way that they got helped. And you can't blame them. You know, From their experience, they tried a million things. The one thing that helped them was this. So then they try to cut off the client's toes and force them in the shoe of whatever it was that helped them. So... Uh, we have to be, you know, be broader thinking that realize that each person who has a problem has a problem for a little bit different reason, and his recovery is going to look different, or her recovery is going to look different than anybody else's. Well, Nick, let me ask you a question. Um, it seems that a lot of the rehabs, not all, but many, are moving towards endorphin-based programs. I see Bradford Recovery has zip lines and uh, wall climbing. Um, 
hiking trails. Um, Milford, Malibu Ranch, believe it or not, uh, has mm -hmm. horseback riding, exercise, swimming pools. Uh, Just Believe, um, up there in Carbondale, uh, has an ethos program, which is an art program. And, and it's really not uh, driven towards, I, I, I'm sure they must have some affiliation with the shoe uh, that fit for others coming into the program, meaning there must be some a degree of AA or uh, maybe smart recovery or something like that. Um, but mm -hmm. this drive for endorphins, uh, is that part of looking for the balance to find happiness, Nick? Well, I, well that's, that's a question also about medication, too. And the, the field really has a false argument about that. Uh, you know, some people are pro-medication, some people are anti-medication before they know who the client is and what their problem is. So, you know, right. it's like insulin. Is medication good? Is insulin good or bad? Well, if you have diabetes, insulin will help you. If you take it and you don't have diabetes, it might kill you if you take too much. So I think the sad thing about medication from just not through, from research, but just from looking at the field, it seems like the people who really need it the most don't get it. And the people who don't really need it take the most of it. So, so, so uh, I, I wish we could get that match better. You know, there shouldn't be a prejudice for or against medication. It should be, will medication be helpful in this particular circumstance? And will, the, is the dose the right dose? Like, if you, can, you can medicate somebody's pain and they'll walk around like a zombie and they won't be in pain anymore, but that's not a good dose for the medication. You know, that's some of the places in the olden days that was good for the staff because the, the client didn't cause any troubles if they were heavily medicated. But it's really, um, well, you know, because that's your field, uh, you have to find the right dose for medication and it has to be, there's ways medication can help you and ways medication can hurt you. And it's the doctor's job to be sure he's doing one and not the other. You were so, telling so, me earlier that many people say they have a good side, have a good side. and a bad side, but you, you don't feel that, that that's exactly true, that people have a good side and a bad side. And it's tied into your concept of recovery, Nick. How, how do you mean that? Uh, yes, I don't think that's true because people are, are always going to be in war with themselves if they believe it, if they believe that, and the good side will always be trying to kill the bad side. It comes to mind like a cartoon where there's a devil on one shoulder and the an angel on the other shoulder. Yeah. And whoever wins the argument, you know, the devil slaps off the angel or vice versa. And um, right. you know, people really, I think, have two good sides. There's there's um, uh -huh. there's your there's your intellectual side, and then there's your survival side. And, and your survival side, they're both good sides. Like your survival side really is important because uh, you jump out of the way of a car without even thinking. So if you're only counting on your intellectual side, you'll be saying, oh, this car is approaching me at a, a, a speed of this miles, miles an hour, and, if I, and, should, and then boom, you'll be hit before you can figure out that you should jump out of the way. So there's so many ways that that good side, that survival side helps us or is trying to help us, and, and it gets misunderstood. So... It, if a person has experienced certain things, it's usually that that side they've learned, like that side that keep, it's hard to explain that it learns without words and it, it's not exactly learning, but it's really smart. So I had a friend say, who was in the, in service and when he came back, he uh, had a habit that he couldn't sit any place in the room except in the corner and look out. And at first he didn't even realize why. Uh, but it's because when he was in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, if he people were behind him, he could be dead. So that side of him was really helping him. That side of him was smart, even though he didn't know it was there. And then once he realized it, the two sides worked together. Uh, it was easy, and he, you know, it kind of went away. So the the side is always trying to protect you. That gets angry or gets mad, or the, you know, the fight, flight, and freeze response. There's always a reason for that. And instead of trying to kill that, try to understand that and work with that. And then when your two sides are working together, you'll be a much happier person, I think. I love it. I love it. So there's two sides to every person. But yeah, the both... other side is really smart because nobody ever has to teach us to be uh, oh, good side. Um, yeah. thirsty or horny. Like we're, that just comes automatically. Our body knows what to do. And it, we can't blame it for keeping track of when we got hurt and when we didn't get hurt, when it worked out good and when it didn't work out good. So that side just needs the partner of our intellectual side to say, well, now we're in a different situation. Maybe when we were deep in our addiction and we were on the street, it was a good rule. Don't trust anybody. Don't turn your back on anybody. 
but now we're in treatment. And so I have to try to let this side understand that now we can trust somebody. We're not in physical danger anymore. And uh, I think that's important, in not just for people with addiction problems, but for everybody. People feel guilty about so many things um, when they really shouldn't. Mm-hmm. You have a very, positive, uh, a very positive way of looking at things in a holistic way or a total way. So like with the veteran, uh, he might have suspicion or he might have vigilance, but it's a good thing because it's like jumping out of a car, uh, a car's way. You jump out of a car's way, you say, oh, you're a jumpy person. You must be two sides. You have a good side and a bad side. No, both sides are there to protect us. We just have to embrace both sides. And learn how to right, live. And you think you're a freak sometimes. Like you think, what's wrong with me? Why am I like this? You know, I must be a really abnormal, horrible person that I'm in a room with friends and I have to sit in the corner. Uh, you know, there's something must be wrong with me. A, a similar uh, case happened in um, after 9-11. Uh, the person went to get gas and the smell of gas triggered. The person started sweating and they didn't understand that. But it was that bodies, you know, relating this smell with danger. And it was trying to be helpful, you know. In the, in the gas station, it wasn't that, it wasn't that helpful. But that's that's what that's really amazing to me that that side of you can do so many things without you even thinking about it. Well, Nick, we're going to talk more. We're going to take a short break, uh, but we're going to talk more about human motivation and what motivates people and why some people seem unmotivated. Because you were talking to me earlier about positive and negative motivation, but we'll get into that. Uh, after the break, you're listening to Dr. John G. Kuna, 94.3 FM, The Talker. Welcome back, folks. On the couch with Dr. John G. Kuna. Joining us today, again, is our illustrious producer, Mr. D.C. Taylor. Yes. Good show. It is. It is a very good show. They're all good, but this is exceptionally good. I think you have exceptionally good. Uh, and our guest for today, Mr. Nick Rose of the Barryville Area Arts Center. Nick, you were telling me during the break that, that you have people come to the art center and you teach a happiness class, but it's a different kind of happiness because they're almost happy when they come there. It's not the happiness that people fight for and strive for when they're fighting for drug and alcohol recovery. When I did the um, happiness among mandated clients, the, the, the people got forced to come to the class, and then um, I felt like I could be more helpful to them because they came in thinking it was all a bunch of baloney uh, and they really might not have ever been happy unless they got exposed to some of these kind of ideas. And can, it's just opening up the door that being happy is possible. And once you do that, then it's easy to be happy. But the people who come now to the class that I teach, they give me more credit than I deserve because there's three quarters happy by the time they come. You know, they're, they're looking, <laughs> you're looking to be happy. They want to be happier. And so they're so open. Uh, so, uh, you know, my specialty or our specialty where I worked was dealing, helping people who didn't seem like they wanted to be helped on the outside. You know, you, were, you and I were talking about um, the rough brass knuckles approach to drug and alcohol, um, you know, emotionally and punitively uh, causing emotional pain on people. And I think that Miller and Rolnick, I think it was Dr. Rolnick was part of an a Australian drug and alcohol recovery center that had a 97% recidivism rate and they wondered why. And it was because all of it was, um, this emotional pounding, this, this emotional beating up that they did with clients, clients got out, they went right back to drugs and alcohol. And some right, people other- are, are, are not just motivated, but Nick, you were talking to me about the difference between positive motivation and no- negative motivation. Uh, how does that play? What is the balance between that? Well, I think that 3% you were talking about first, um, that they did it in spite of the program instead of because of the program when it was a competition. <laughs> that's, that's what the research shows. Like those three were so good that they could even overcome all the, all the you know, uninformed right, things that right. they did to them. So, so I think there's, a, you know, if you think about how you make your choices, this is true of everybody, not just people with uh, substance abuse problems, but you either make your choices on the basis of what you do want or the basis of what you don't want. And when you make your choices on the basis of you don't want, that's called negative motivation. It's still good, like the people who came to our program because they didn't want to go to jail, that was a good place for them to start. So people who make their choices on the basis of what they don't want uh, might get married because they don't want to be lonely. They might get a job because they don't want to be poor. And that's good. It helps them achieve those goals. But if 
you have positive motivation, it's more compatible with happiness because your main, motive, your main emotion is going to be hope instead of fear. So you will get married because you found a special person and you think you can accomplish all these uh, wonderful things together. Or you have a passion for helping animals and you become a veterinarian. So if you think about your own life, probably all of our choices are made from these two things. Like there's not such a thing as a person who's not motivated. They might not be motivated for what we want them to do, but they're surely motivated in some kind of a way, you know, even if it's just for survival. So when you have negative motivation, that's good because it's a great start. But if you can try to turn that into positive motivation, that's going to work much better. And usually you can do that by looking forward instead of looking backward. A lot of treatment and a lot of people uh, look back at their past mistakes and right, uh, right. try to figure out how they did wrong. And that's really uh, almost useless because if you think about it and you're lost and, you're, and you, you know, you're driving your car and you roll down your window, you never say, pardon me, could you help tell me how I got here? You know, that's not the important <laughs> information that you want to know. You want to know, can I, how can I get to where I want to go? <laughs> so I think right. people have to look forward instead of backwards. And uh, when you look forward, it's so much, so much better. You look backwards. If you do look backwards, look backwards at exceptions when you didn't have the problem. And you'll learn more from that than you will from all the mistakes that you keep going over again in your head and beating yourself up for. And I think that's an incredibly important factor in substance recovery is the ability to look forward and not look backward. And it might have something to do with why um, many treatment centers historically have, again, spent a lot of time with the brass knuckles approach um, with punitive emotions, having clients go through the misery of where did they come from and how, you know, what was their past and not spending enough time as to what their future could be and, and motivating them towards uh, a positive future, goal, right goal achievement. The whole face of the, you, the person you're talking to changes because you're so used to having their nose rubbed in their past mistakes and that being full right. treatment that when you talk about, when you say what are your goals, they might not have ever thought about that before. You know, there's really two approaches uh, to life and to treatment. A problem-solving approach, which is tried and true, a lot of people use it, but a goal achievement approach is really better. With the problem-solving approach, you, um, you talk about your problems, you pick one that you usually call the presenting problem, then you look for all the causes of the problem, which is really all the reasons why the client is a rotten person, and then you make a plan to address that problem and hopefully the problem disappears. But there's a lot of problems with that because, first of all, people don't like to talk about problems as much as they like to talk about goals. You might think that the person's problem is that they drink too much, and they may think the problem is that their wife nags. So you have a disagreement about that. Uh, but if you look at, take a goal achievement approach and you talk about what the person wants out of life, uh, they might not have even ever thought about that before because they might have just been thinking, how can I get through this next hour or this next day? with all the pain I'm in. So once they start to think about that, you can see you know, a, a change come about them, and they start to think what they would want. Um, and as that, as that comes into being, the negative motivation can get changed into positive motivation. You know, Nick, I went on uh, your Facebook page uh, for the Barryville Area Art Center, and you have so many activities. You have uh, magic shows, pumpkin festivals, painting. You have so many activities there. Um, uh, Coney Island Parade. It's just so amazing. So much such happiness, such life. Why is it, Nick, do you think that happiness eludes so many people? It, they just can't seem to find happiness. Well, there's a lot of the things that we've already talked about. They might uh, confuse happiness with pleasure, which will send them down a kind of a dead-end street. Mm -hmm. They might think they have to suffer you know, to, to become happy. They might not really be willing to be happy. They might only be willing to be happy under certain circumstances that are not at all realistic. Uh, one, of, one of the things we use, you probably heard of it, um, is a miracle question where you just close your eyes and imagine life is exactly the way you want it and it's perfect. Uh, and you describe that. And then the more meat you can put on those bones and describe what you're likely to be like if it's perfect, the more you can get yourself long-term goals and be happy. And almost no one that we did this with ever said, you know, I want to be king of the world and have $20 million. They all had very realistic goals. Like I'd like to have a job doing this and a family with this and that, and all things that they could, they could really happen. So once you get those 
uh, long-term goals, then there's kind of a trick to divide that up into a lot of easily achievable short-term goals so you keep experiencing success. And there's a lot of uh, practical things that you can do for that, which, which I, you know, we took over in my class. And then it's not really uh, rocket science. It's not where the, the, the stuff that we talk about is like, oh, happiness is a deep well. There's nothing like philosophical or anything like that. It's all kind of practical things that you can do that will make you into a happier person. Nick, like one would, how did you ever come from being 20, 20 plus years as a drug and re, uh, alcohol rehab counselor, your first passion, your first love? How did you ever, I know we're coming close to the end of the show, but how did you ever come to make the Barryville Area uh, Art Center as creative as it is? Well, I had that side to me all along, but I kind of had to sit on it because I was kind of the face public face of the program where I worked, so I couldn't really have too much fun. <laughs> That's putting it a little bit in a humorous <laughs> way, but like I always worried that whatever I did would be a reflection on the program that I served and the population that I served. So I was, uh, unless I was behind closed door, I, I never did anything publicly that I thought would reflect badly on them. So, uh, you know, a lot of art and music can be controversial. Uh, it can tug at emotions. So now I'm uh, freed in a way that I'm, you know, I'm writing songs and I'm drawing pictures that I never would have done when I was not any, I don't do any pornography or anything like that, but it's just that it's very right, right. Not, not to have to worry how is this going to affect, you know, the place that I love because um, I think I was too much associated with, with the place, you know. Um, the, the yeah. People should be loyal yeah, to the with, mission. Yeah, stay within the... Not to yeah, the person. I, I'm just amazed. Nick? If somebody wants to contact you at the Barryville Area Arts Center, how would they go about contacting you? Uh, Barryville Area Arts dot uh, Barryville Area Arts at gmail dot com. Excellent. Is there a phone number to go with that, or just just the web? Yes. Yeah. Four five 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 seven eight seven one three. Nick, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Believe me, it was a true pleasure. You're listening thanks. to Dr. John G. Kuna. On the couch, 94.3 FM, The Talker.